Hi, good morning, welcome, it's 10 a.m. Welcome to the application of sensors in precision agriculture. My name is Sara Burintu, I'm based at Sons University and I welcome you all. We have 80 participants at the moment. Um, I will be presenting and facilitating this webinar. I'll be the, doing the speaker's presentations in the second session. Uh, for this first uh, session, uh, my colleague, uh, Hugo Sullivan will guide you through um, the, the webinar. So you, the stage is yours uh, whenever you're ready.
Thanks a million, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Hugh O'Sullivan, and I'm a marine environmental scientist on the STREAM project, and I'm based in Waterford Institute of Technology in the southeast of Ireland. Uh, welcome to this webinar, and before we get started, I would just like to quickly go through the webinar format. Um, so, so, you are in view and listen uh, only mode. If you would like to ask questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A box to ask the questions and we'll get to those as soon as we can um, and we'll pose those questions to the speakers as well. And um, if you want to make comments or suggestions, please do so in the chat box, but please uh, don't ask questions in the chat box and just use it only for comments and suggestions. Okay, thank you very much. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, Hugh, uh, for this uh, quick presentation. Uh, I hope you can see my uh, my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Sorry, share uh, this stop screen. Yes, apologies. So, uh, can I just uh, wondering if you can see my screen? I will sharing my screen now. Hope you can see it. Um, so basically, I will start. Uh, I'll kick off this uh, this webinar just by highlighting and uh, providing the basics of what we are what we'll be talking here. Uh, so as I mentioned before, I'm based at Swans University. Uh, I work at the Center for Sustainable Aquatic Research, and basically, we'll start with the basics. So aquaculture, as you know, is the farming of aquatic organisms. And today, in this webinar, we'll be having speakers discussing shellfish uh, in Ireland, uh, also shellfish and seaweeds in Wales, uh, and also fish, of course. So farming of aquatic organisms in freshwater environment and also in um, in the marine environment. Um, so, but what is precision aquaculture? Uh, basically, uh, it's the, having uh, these the sensors that can collect data about the environment and the species. And that data can then be uh, used and transformed into very valuable information so that it can support the decision making uh, for farmers and, uh, and their operations. I, I would need to say that this is, this is not new. I mean, this has been ongoing uh, in agriculture, especially for quite a long time. If I compare uh, the research uh, taking place uh, in the past six years, for instance, and I'm just taking the number of review articles and research articles and book chapters related with precision uh, agriculture, we have over 44,000 and aquaculture is lagging behind with only 3,400. Um, of course, uh, this is, this is, because aquaculture, and it's very important, again, it's an aquatic environment. And this environment is, is very challenging, as we all know, especially now when you are moving also uh, to offshore conditions. Uh, so, uh, you know, aquaculture in at sea and is a harsh environment. The access to these sites can be impeded by weather. Uh, power and can connectivity can be an issue. And this is essential to collect this data. And of course, we are talking about large range of spatial scales. Of course, when I'm talking about this, I'm mentioning at sea environments. Uh, we will also have speakers uh, uh, in, the, in the second session talking about recirculating aquaculture systems, which will not have the same, uh, the same challenges. Um, so, but uh, aquaculture is trying to pick up and is actually picking up and there is a big driver and motivation uh, to move towards precision. And this is precisely because farms are getting bigger and they're moving offshore. Uh, also, we have pressure from consumers and regulators. Uh, we have a pressure to have greater sustainable farming uh, and better welfare, animal welfare. And now we have uh, this concept that aquaculture can actually provide potentially positive impact with this concept of restorative aquaculture. And to be able to have all this and to validate all this, we need data. And that's where the precision aquaculture uh, is so relevant. And on top of all this, one of the big drivers, as you'll see today from the many speakers discussing this, is precisely the new, um, the new uh, in real time sensor technologies that we now have available. So, and if you want to, just to go a bit deeper, precision aquaculture, the typical framework, you have sensors that will collect and integrate data on the environment. And we'll see this, uh, uh, Paul Shannon, for instance, will discuss some of the data, but you have the aquatic environment data, temperature, nutrients, pH, salinity, pollutants, just to name a few. You also can acquire data on the species and you will have uh, uh, colleagues in, in the second session discussing lumpfish behavior. So this is related to a species. 
And we also uh, can integrate with existing data and weather and hydrography. So this is what we call observation and getting this data from the environment. And of course, we need to make an interpretation of this data and we need to have models. Uh, in the case, if you're collecting images and you'll see also this uh, in one of our sessions, we need to have image analysis that will allow us to, have, to make forecasts. And then we want, once we have this data, the algorithms and the model that allow to uh, create information, meaningful information, we can then have a support decision tool where the farmer can design, decide and act. Uh, so it could be a feed, uh, feed management, it could be a, a better harvesting or optimized harvesting schedule, a veterinary uh, intervention, it may be an early warning system and a risk analysis. So this is the concept of, uh, that, that you can see visualized here, precision agriculture. In this case, we have fish in a cage. It can be shellfish, it can be seaweeds, but the concept is having the species that you are farming, you will have sensors, a different type of sensors that will collect data. And ideally, this is what we are aiming for now is real-time monitoring. So moving forward, uh, what precision aquaculture, and we'll see this being mentioned here, uh, sensors need to be robust and low cost. Low cost. Most of the speakers today will, will discuss this. Uh, they need to be capable of underwater and in-air wireless connectivity and can be a challenge. They need to have a high level of interoperability. You'll have different sensors that they need to communicate and the data needs to be uh, relevant. Um, and then we have data management. The models need to be robust. And there's something, a key element to this that uh, uh, it may not be, uh, we may not have time to discuss here today, but there is of course, uh, this all this data that is being collected. So there is an issue of security and the sovereignty of this data that is critical to exploit technology in an ethical and commercially sustainable way. So this is basically my five minute presentation on precision aquaculture, just to set the stage uh, and um, what I'm gonna do now. So I thank you for, for listening to this uh, first part of my talk. What I'm gonna do now is carrying on and introduce you to the project that is actually also uh, funding this webinar, but is, uh, is, uh, has a component of, uh, of aquaculture to it that I think it will be very relevant in welfare. So access to sea uh, is basically new opportunities for more competitive and sustainable blue growth in the Atlantic zone. Uh, the main aim, as you can see from the title, the long title is to improve the availability of the Atlantic shore for aquaculture uh, SMEs. And this is by enabling, enabling business opportunities uh, in a more sustainable operating environment, which as you can see, precision aquaculture ticks all these boxes. Um, so our partners in Access to Sea uh, are from the Atlantic area, are the United Kingdom, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, and France. Um, and we have what we call the products, which is basically what we aim to deliver for. And for those of you in the audience, if you are interested in spatial planning, uh, we will actually have a webinar in July, but that is one of the deliverables that um, the Access to Sea project has, which is to have uh, a map of the different countries uh, where spatial planning is taking place and trying to get the best uh, and um, the best case studies in these different countries. We are also developing business models, as you can see, and especially because of COVID, but also because of different consumer trends and the market is changing. So new business models may be arising, and this is something that we'll also, uh, the, this, this project is looking into. But what is uh, relevant to this webinar today is the social acceptability. So Access to Sea aims to increase social acceptability by having a strategy to improve this accessibility. And in the case of the UK, uh, we've realized that, lump, uh, that welfare in general is, is very important. And we identified specifically the cleaner fish, so lump fish, uh, as, uh, as very relevant to discuss and to actually implement new tools for uh, implement uh, proper lumpfish welfare um, at the salmon cages. So if you're not familiar with lumpfish, uh, they are very cute, but on top of that, uh, they are uh, used at uh, salmon cages uh, because they are, uh, bio, it's a biocontrol uh, tool, let's say, where um, so the lumpfish are eating sea lice um, because sea lice are uh, external parasite in salmon. And they can, of course, impact uh, salmon growth, health, and welfare. And basically, the lumpfish are there to clean. That's why we call cleaner fish to eat those sea lice from the salmon. 
And so basically, uh, there are other ways to uh, remove the, these parasites from the semen, uh, but um, some of them are less efficient and chemicals are not uh, have been used before, but uh, sea lice has, has gained resistant to this. And actually, um, lumpfish are, uh, they can re remove and they can decrease the anti-sea lice drugs by 80%. Um, there is a caveat here, which is the welfare, which is what we're talking here. Uh, the salmon farming industry has been criticized oftentimes for not doing enough to maintain the welfare of, of lumpfish. And there, there's been many concerns that were raised by consumers that prompt pressure groups to discourage the use of, um, of cleaner fish until these welfare standards are, welfare standards are met. Uh, and there's actually studies suggesting that consumers are willing to pay uh, for better welfare for, for fish in aquaculture. So Swansea University and the Center for Sustainable Aquatic Research, in collaboration with, um, with the salmon industry, uh, we are developing technologies and basically a tool that will be accessible online and you can download as a software uh, that will allow uh, farmers to monitor and record the welfare of lumpfish. The tool will have a component of online training, but it also have a body mass index calculator to see if lumpfish are overweight, or most likely underweight or emaciated, and also a rapid welfare assessment tool that is based on a ser series of operational um, lumpfish welfare um, practical uh, tools that were developed by, by CSER, by the Center for Sustainable Aquatic Research. So um, what this tool allows is that once you have an input data uh, about uh, the biometry of the fish, for instance, and you have a score system for the welfare of fish based on the skin or the eye condition and the suction deformities, then once you have that data, this tool will then uh, integrate the data and calculate the body max index, the body height, the lumpfish operation welfare score index, which will allow you to know and to tell you if the lumpfish are in good welfare or in a poor welfare state. So then we have, and this is the critical bit, and that's why it's important to have these algorithms, um, and it's the, the component that allows for farmers to decide and it's supporting decision tool. So we, we have in this case, it will allow the farmer to know what is the proportion of fish that are emaciated, normal weight, underweight or overfed. It will also provide a maximum mesh size that should be used to prevent uh, lumpfish from escaping from sea cages. And it also allows uh, and provides basic statistics on a series of descriptors, but above all, it provides remedial actions. And this is what, what this is fundamental in this case, we're talking about remedial actions. So um, this is basically uh, the, what I wanted to discuss with you in terms of what this project is doing. Um, I, I want to thank you for listening for these two talks, which are introduction talks. Um, I'll leave uh, Hugh, I hope that I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, of course. Uh, I wish you a fantastic webinar uh, and thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. And yes, lumpfish are very cute. <laughs> so our next presentation, um, we're going to move on uh, now to a presentation from Professor uh, Carlos Garcia de Linez. Um, and just if you have any questions, you can ask away in the Q&A box and Sarah will be happy to answer those. So as I said, moving on now to Professor uh, Carlos Garcia de Linez. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just give it over to you, Carlos, and good luck. Okay, so thank you so much. So the second uh, project that is uh, hosting this webinar is STREAM that I'm going to introduce now briefly. So STREAM stands for Sensor Technologies for Remote Environmental Aquatic Monitoring. And this is a project that is funded by the European Union through the Ireland Wales program. Okay, so what is the purpose of STREAM? The purpose is to monitor the coastal and estuarine environment around both Ireland and Wales and in particular to monitor data on temperature, on nutrients, on oxygen and phytoplankton. Okay, so this is the main purpose of this project. And to do that, uh, STREAM consists of three uh, different partners. Uh, the coordinator is the Wacker Institute of Technology, uh, Dr. Uh, John Mahani. And then we have Master Technological University also in Ireland and finally Science University here in Wales. And we bring three different, four different areas of expertise. We bring expertise in optical sensors, 
at uh, Watford, we bring expertise on analytical chemistry at Munster, and we bring expertise on printable sensors and aquaculture at Swansea University. So this project is structured around seven work packages. The first work package is about management and governance. The second one is about the specification, detail, the specs that these sensors need to have. The third work package is about disseminating the source of the stream. And work package four deals with ICT enabled sensor technologies. Work package five deals with sampling and monitoring. Work package six deals with the deployment of the sensors. And finally, work package seven is about capacity building and in particular in relation to the future changes which uh, uh, climate change is likely to bring about in the IBC. So the main challenge that we want to address in this project that we are addressing in this project is very simple. How to make the best possible use of environmental data? And the approach that we are taking is a three pronged approach. On the one hand, is by using better sensors to develop a more affordable, cheaper sensors. And to do that, uh, the new sensors which are being developed are going to be are being benchmarked against commercial sensors. And that will enable us to test the performance of the sensors that were developed in the stream. Okay. The second way that we are approaching this challenge and we are trying to overcome this challenge is by being clever about how these sensors are deployed. And we need to do that in a way that will provide the best possible uh, data in the, in the most efficient way. And a range of uh, sensors, uh, an array of sophisticated sensors is being deployed both around iron and ways for this purpose. And the third way that we are uh, using to overcome this challenge is that all this data would not be of any use if it was not available accessible to users. So for that reason, an online portal is being developed that will enable users to access both data in real time and also to have access to data that has been stored previously. And this is, in essence, the three approaches that we are taking on stream. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Carlos. And um, if anyone has any questions for Carlos, please uh, feel free to type into the Q&A box and he'll get to those as quickly as he can. And um, so our next speaker uh, is Dr. Sophia Teixeira from the Tyndall Institute of Ireland. Um, and over to you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have a slightly different approach. So I, I'm not as studying in all the types of fish. So I only develop the sensors. And after um, I collaborate with someone who actually does the measurement. So I will talk about some of the applications we did, but more about why the importance of using uh, sensors for uh, welfare of fish. So basically, we develop different types of sensors independent of the materials. They can be from carbon, carbon materials to uh, novel metals. Uh, we modify that surface. Um, depending on the target biomarker we are interested, we modify according what we need. After we attach the bioreceptor, which we are interested in, and we will have um, a signal. All these sensors can be three electrodes uh, system or two electrode systems, depending on the um, target we are interested um, in. So uh, the quantification of biomarkers, it, biomarkers is, uh, can be done in very different ways. So first we identify what is the target we are interested, uh, can vary from many different uh, 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 targets. Uh, what we do is we collect a sample um, and we add in our sensor. That samples can be differed from, from different uh, uh, um, types of, of uh, um, species. And after we use uh, the electronics in combination with the sensor to have a, a, a monitoring on a computer or a phone, um, doesn't matter if we have a connection to a, a device. We can use biomarkers for different types of, um, of material, of, of screenings or diagnosis. 
So we use for the screening to understand the highly specific and to minimize as well false positives or negatives depending on the target. Uh, we can use for do uh, easily detected and without non-invasive procedures and as well be cost effective. Uh, as a diagnosis, we are interested in the sensitivity of the sensor, the most specificity, and actually the accuracy of that uh, tests. And we can use for a prognosis or for outcome of treatment. So we actually can understand if we are doing a treatment, how that can progress during uh, the time. We can use different types of, of uh, screening of biomarkers. So we can have from bloody urine, tissue samples, pus, um, salmon. So any, any type of sample we are interested in, we can um, measure in the, in the sensors. Um, as well, we can measure from water uh, on, on the type of, of, of uh, for understanding uh, non-invasion measurements for fish, we can actually detect from water instead um, be invasive and, and, and add on the fish. The test we've been actually doing is for the cortisol. So uh, on this, I, I collaborate actually with Swansea University on these tests. And what we did, we developed a sensor not to detect the level of stress on the fish, but from the water of the fish. So what we did, we used, um, we modified the sensor for detect uh, cortisol and uh, we collect different samples of water from different uh, um, um, environments. One's more rich environments, another more poor environments. And the idea was to understand if this environment actually was affecting uh, uh, the, the response of the fish. And um, we, with all the tests we did, we arrived to a level of detection of five femtograms per milliliter. We could be able to detect on the water. And that was in correlation with um, all the, the, the physiological and behavior uh, uh, tests we did as well. So we could understand the cortisol levels was higher when we had a poor uh, uh, environment. So when it was more stressed behavior as well, the, the weight was um, less on that environment. And we could understand the metabolic rate as well was higher for when we have um, high um, stress on that type of fish. So the different, um, so what we did was for, for stress, but we can as well use for different types of targeting for, for fish uh, to understand the welfare of them. We can use as immune function. We can understand the metabolism change of that, that animal, the natural behavior, the reproduced capacity and the growth change um, of the, the fish. Here we have <coughs> different sensors we developed already. So one is called Patsu. So it's basically a small capsule we have inside the electronics and the sensor. And we can uh, attach this, um, actually add on the water or in a tank or in a bioreactor or whatever we are interested in. And we have a response in real time monitoring for what is happening uh, to that biomarkers which we modified on the sensor. As well, we developed uh, five different, so it's a sensor, has five different measures to understand um, different uh, um, uh, biomarkers on, on the, 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 the water. And uh, uh, this was, was um, like, you, you have like a fish and inside that fish, we have all the electronics and the sensor attached. And um, we can um, add on the water or whatever we were interested in, 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 in the field and understand the level of um, the, the, the biomarkers are on that environment. As well, we've been working lately in uh, using a different approach. So we have uh, doing flexible sensors, which can be, which are wearable flexible sensors, which we can attach in a fish or actually add inside the fish to understand different biomarkers um, we have in. And this is what we are working um, at the moment. So, um, and this is my presentation. If you have any questions, let me know. 
I think I think there is also already a question, right, Yuk? And uh, if there are no more questions, I also have a few questions actually. But you go ahead and uh, and please. Yeah, that's no problem. That's very interesting. I can't believe the scale that you've gotten those sensors down to. Um, so the first question comes from uh, Rod Wilson. So interesting sensor for cortisol in water. How bad does the stress need to be to detect a significant change in water cortisol? Also, um, this will depend on the biomass of water volume, uh, biomass to water volume ratio and the flushing rate of the tank to cage uh, with new water. So how are these taken into account to interpret the cortisol data? Okay, that is a very <laughs> long question. <laughs> um, so basically, this, the sensors are very sensitive, so the stress doesn't need to be uh, uh, very big. So we can go at, at ranges of femtograms uh, of level of stress in, 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 the, in the, the, um, the environment itself. When we did this test, we did in a uh, lab-based uh, um, scales. So basically is the small tanks we have in the lab. So we didn't do at big scale. So I don't know how that will actually interfere in, in, in that regard. So on that, I cannot comment because I really don't know yet because we did everything at lab scales. So um, I imagine that will interfere for sure, depending on the scale, because if this is in a big farm tank or in, in, in uh, East Wari or in the sea, of course, will change completely. And uh, we needed to have a different approach on developing the sensor itself as well. Because if you add the sensor there for months, we need to introduce on the developing of the sensor a stage of cleaning as well, because the longer it is, the biofouling will accumulate it. So depends what, what we are interested in, uh, but yes, it's it's going to have an interference, but we have to have that in account depending where we are going to test. Hope I've replied the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Um, okay, so the next one comes from Michael and it's uh, how durable are the sensors? So at the moment, we can use them for 30 days. Excellent. This is okay. the maximum we can reuse it. After that, they start being very, very unstable. And Michael also asks again, um, are the sensors affected by biofilm growth? Yes, they are. So it's why I said, so at the moment we add a step of cleaning on the process um, because uh, of, of course they are in contact with a lot of microorganisms and the waters and, and with the time we have a layer on the surface. So we add a step cleaning um, a few in few hours to help the cleaning the sensor and be able to have a more accurate uh, measurement. Okay, excellent. Um, Sarah, do you want to ask, you said you had a few questions? I just have one, sorry, out of curiosity. Yeah. So there are sensors that can be placed in the water to access not only the environment, but also if there are some metabolites that can be excreted by the fish. Yeah. Then you have sensors that you can uh, wear, that you can uh, attach to the, to the fish. And then you have sensors that can be inside the body of the fish, if I understood well. So there are three levels. Yes. How, how difficult is this to calibrate these sensors? And of course, they will be measuring different things and they will have different purposes. But the thing is, how difficult are they to calibrate? How long do they take to develop? And how expensive are they? Three questions. <laughs> so how long do they take to develop? Uh, they really, when what was hard was arrive to have a working sensor. After developing takes a few weeks in depending which type of uh, target we are interested. But because we are trying so many different targets at the moment, um, it's, it's very, very easy to do and not time consuming and will take probably for a sensor itself from the beginning till the end, less than a week at the moment. Um, in terms of costs, uh, I don't have an accurate idea, but at the moment they should cost as they are in the lab and around 20 euros each, which is expensive, I know, but I'm working on the process of trying to bring all this down, but it's, it's, it's not easy. But at the moment is more or less around that, the cost of each of the sensors. Uh, what was the third question, Sarah? Sorry. It's, it's just that you have three different levels of sensitive of sensors, isn't it? The individual, uh, oh, yeah. uh, wearable, and, and the environment. 
just a question what is uh, from your perspective and what you've been requested by research and industry what are the ones that are mostly likely that farmers will want to have what is the the biggest demand do you have an idea so at the moment even from industry the most interesting ones is the outside one so basically is that we put in egg type ish or in in, in a small thing uh, on the top of the water and basically what they're only gonna monitor to the time. That is even from industry to using bioreactors and all these things, this is what they are more interested at the moment. The wireless we are developing actually for medical applications because the first idea or the first project came as a medical application. But now because I've been approached to work on more this area. So we are trying to break this with attached to a fish um, instead be a person. So it's the same principle. Um, the wearables or the implantables, I mean, um, it's because I start with a project for implantables in a, a catheter. And that is how this started. So, and from there, um, I, um, because I spoke with some people on the areas of fish and they were interested actually in grab this type of sensors and add on the fish inside to have a mar more accurate uh, um, reply and they wanted to understand the growth of the fish and that was the best approach for them. So um, the, all of these sensors start being developed actually for medical applications. This was what I started, but after, because the interesting on this area was actually a, a lot, I start developing as well for this, for this. It's why I have three different approaches because um, depending what the persons are more okay. interested in and I can provide. Very quickly, because we need to move for our next uh, one, and sorry for jumping in, but there is a question if you uh, are also developing for other organisms such as crustaceans, or right now it's only fish. At the moment, I only have four fish. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it to you, you to thank carry you. on. And thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Yeah, that's no problem. That's that's very interesting. And please feel free to just keep uh, asking questions away in the Q&A box, and there's no problem doing that throughout the webinar. Um, so next up, we have Professor David Gethin from the Welsh Centre um, for uh, Printing and Coding at Swansea University. So over to you, David. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Just get myself up on the full screen here. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the manufacture of printing of, of sensors. Uh, it's been the, the previous talks have sort of set the scene quite nicely for that. Um, so we're involved with Stream in looking at the way which we can look for printing sensors for deployment in the um, aquatic environment, essentially. And essentially, if you like, uh, when we come to looking at monitoring the aquatic environment, there's a number of things which we need to, to, to look at. The, the common ones are temperature, uh, typically five, 25 degrees C are the typical application ranges, uh, pH, salinity, dissolved oxygen, dissolved solids, organic matter, chlorophyll, turbidity, ionic salts, nitrates, and there are many more. And essentially, it, 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 they are already available to us commercial uh, uh, devices. Uh, I've shown there an example there of a, of a commercial device. It's essentially a sond. And within that sond, we have a number of sensors mounted in that in, to measure whatever you choose to do so. Uh, this is provided by Xylem. There are other manufacturers of, of these devices as well. So again, uh, building on the previous presentations, then uh, when we come to looking at data capture, Sarah mentioned this quite uh, extensively, then uh, gathering data back from the SONs has come by handheld, preferred by wireless transmission to a receiving portal. And essentially in that way, we can generate very large volumes of data which we can then look to analyze. And part of the stream activity is taking large volumes of data and to look at big data analytics in terms of understanding what we are capturing, uh, provided the, the data is, uh, is good and, uh, and, and reliable. Obviously the management of that are time trends, space trends, et cetera, et cetera. So there's plenty of options there for manipulating the, the, the data once you've got it. Why do we need printable sensors? Well, Sophia has mentioned, uh, shown some uh, pre on, on a previous presentation, some sensors which are printable for electrochemical type measurements. Uh, 
Uh, but essentially, if you're looking for commercial systems, they are very accurate, sure, but they're also very high cost. And typically a sonde and a sensor would be around about £20,000 of investments. And so that, I guess, is quite a major barrier to the widespread monitoring of aquatic environments, as I understand it. What I would say is that printable sensors are offer the potential for lower cost solutions. So uh, once we've got the sensor technology developed, then producing them is a, is a routine printing process, which is essentially a, a low cost process, but we have to get the materials selected correctly and working properly for the printing process itself. Um, also, the opportunity now with printable sensors is that you can, on one chip or one card essentially, integrate a number of different sensors, provide you can have commonality of the inks as necessary to fabricate those sensors. Uh, the challenge is, as, well, as I see it, for looking at printable sensors for the aquatic environment is obviously measurement accuracy. There's a need for calibration, and that could be against laboratory and commercial devices. And certainly within the stream, we'll be looking to carefully at the uh, measurement accuracy and probably calibration against commercial devices. There's the question of survival in a harsh environment. Um, and again, we, under, we begin to understand that and the working duration again, which uh, uh, as, as mentioned, and the working duration is very much the way determined by the way which you fabricate the sensor on the uh, materials which you choose, because in a working environment, then you have water and you look for, for materials which show very poor permeability or water vapor transmission characteristics. So understanding the materials to, to survive for long working duration is, is quite a challenge. So when we've started on the stream, we looked at the potential for, for printed sensors. And essentially we're looking very much more looking at the phys physical parameters rather than the chemical parameters here. So we're looking at printed sensors for temperature, pH, salinity, uh, dissolved oxygen, and total dissolved solids. There are the other sensors which I mentioned on the, on the earlier slide are uh, generally measured by accurately by optical methods and those optical methods are being developed by our colleagues, uh, Joe Mahoney in, um, in, in Waterford. So therefore then I'll tell you a little bit about how you can make um, uh, these low cost sensors and essentially we use printing methods. And this particular slide here shows you a, an example of, of, a, of, a, of a printing process, which is uh, screen printing. And I guess that these, the, the, the sensor that Sophia showed are, are fabricated by screen printing. And essentially what we can do here is to have a substrate, which it could be paper or polymer film, or it could be a rigid substrate. Uh, we then have a, have, a, have a screen here, which is nothing other than a, a woven mesh. And that woven mesh is aperture is built into it through digital stenciling. And essentially we take an ink system and a squeegee and we just press the ink through the, through the stencil onto the substrate and we deposit onto the substrate like so. And ultimately we end up with a, with a pattern as we see fit. So, and what I would say is that the, in terms of sensor manufacturing, whether it's for, for diversity of applications, biomedical application is principally by screen printing processes that, that uh, sensors are, are delivered. The other potential methods which we which we be considering within stream, I guess, would be using inkjet. And typically we have inkjet systems here which are there for depositing functional materials, i.e. Uh, electrical conduct materials, polymer electronic materials, and the like. And there are commercial devices for doing just that. And the other method which we can look at is there of aerosol jet printing. And again, I know that uh, Joe at uh, Waterford is looking at use of aerosol jet printing for fabricating parts of his optical sensors. And essentially what we do there is to have a have a functional material which we atomize and then we direct it onto the substrate. And typically we can print uh, characteristic uh, lines of this nature. Uh, in this line here is typically about 10 micron wide. So we could, that's the sort of resolution you can get using aerosol jet. But again, there's a learning curve in going how to use that. But again, you can deposit functional materials using these, this sort of technology. When we come to, to fabricating sensors, then essentially what they are are, are multi-layered devices. 
And this is an example of, um, of, of sensor being fabricated. So the first layers here could well be uh, conductive, conductive electrodes, essentially. It could be silver, could be carbon, depending on the application. There would be some sort of sensing element there. And then some over, overlay here of an insulator or protective layer here to fabricate the sensor. So essentially what you've got are screens, uh, which are uh, on the screen printer. You have screens which are mounted in register and consequently you're then able to fabricate and assemble a, sen a sensor in that way. In essentially, in this case, I would guess it's around about three passes. When we come to looking at the stream sensors, we've done an initial study, uh, and it's only initial study, I'm afraid, at, the, at this moment in time. And we looked at sensors for conductivity, and so these are two layer devices, essentially conductive layers, interdigitated electrodes, and some sort of insulating layer around the outside here, and that can be a, a, a silver connect conductor, or it can be a carbon conductor, as the matter might be. We've looked at pH sensors as well, uh, where the sensing layers are, is a, is a is a carbon PSS combination. And we look at temperature sensors as well, which are again looking at resistive elements there within the sensing, within the sensing circuit itself. So therefore then these are examples of those sensors being uh, fabricated. Um, this is the first silver conducting track layer being going down here. And uh, you can see the sensor being printed either onto paper uh, or onto a, a polymer film. The second layer is that of the carbon, which is the sensing layer itself. So carbon is overprinted onto that on register. And then finally, we have the insulating layer built up like so. And these are typical of the arrays of sensors that we can print quite, quite quickly and quite readily using a, a screen printing process. I said we were doing this as an initial study. And I guess the next steps, as far as we're concerned, are the issues of calibration. We've mentioned those already in terms of the, the need for calibration. And I'm sure that when we've ever gone to look at design of sensors, there's going to be a development process there which need, needs to take place. We will also look at the de design for deployment. And I'm sad to say that uh, we, although we started out quite well in the early stages of stream, we have had uh, a lot of problems with, uh, with COVID as everybody else has in terms of working in the lab. Uh, so that's impeded our progress somewhat. Um, what I will say, just to illustrate the way which we can move forward on these things to typical, should typically show that, I'll show you now an example very briefly of, uh, of the work which we did in the potassium sensor, and we'd expect to do the same sort of process to go through calibration and development in the sensor which we're developing for stream. <clears throat> so this is an example of printed potassium sensor. So we've got this conductive layer here, which is the first layer we put down, a transduction layer here, and an insulating layer around it. And within this region here, you can see there's an aperture here. And what we have to put there is, in, is what we call an iron selective membrane. And that determines what actually goes, passes through the membrane onto the, tra onto the transducing layer. So that may be the means by which we could control what we really want to measure. Um, and this was targeting potassium for, for human applications. And the sort of thing that we've got there from that are information in terms of output as a voltage signal versus potassium level. And what we saw with that sensor here is we get very good performance of that. It's a nearly a Nernstian response. And it also shows you what the low detection limit is for that particular sensor. It's around about that level there, whereby the beyond that, then the, uh, the we're not detecting anything sensible at all. We also have to look for the fact that it's selective and Sophia mentioned selectivity here and the issue for potassium sensors as a uh, sensor for human application is whether it actually will uh, s s detect salts. And so therefore this is the response curve with response to uh, potassium, this is the response curve with respect to salt. And so therefore not sodium if you like. And so therefore the potassium ions, it detects the potassium ions only. So that's the issue of addressing selectivity. And I think that's me done for, for now, I think. Okay, yes, it is me done. There we are. So I'll stop sharing. That's great, David. Thanks very much. So um, just to come back, I think we have a few questions. So question from uh, Pete McGovern. David, have you considered a sensor for measuring CO2 in freshwater? 
we've looked at CO2 for, for that, but I think it is, it, it's like everything else. Um, it, the challenges of, of looking at the architecture for the sensor is the issue and the selection materials for that sensor. Uh, principally, we focused on the, the parameters, pH, uh, salinity, and so on and so forth. They're relatively straightforward. When we come to things like dissolved oxygen and CO2, then there's a bit, it's a much more challenging issue to, to look at the architecture and design of the, of the sensor itself. So yes, it's, a, it's something we should think about. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rod Wilson says, um, interesting potassium sensor. Did you check the selectivity against ammonium ions, same charge and hydrate, hydrated radius? No. <laughs> we, we were that's this sort of project we did quite some time ago and the, the, it was for human application. And so therefore then uh, it was uh, for the worried well, essentially. That was the project was about, and uh, we were looking there at potassium and, 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 and sodium. Okay. Um, and then we have another question from Shane Hunter. Uh, could it be possible to use a more conventional probe as a master probe, which can be maintained and calibrated regularly using standard methods as a calibration tool, uh, which can be used to calibrate an array of cheaper printed probes? We would have to look at the when it comes to calibration, print, printing a batch of probes, then you would have to have to do the calibration checks against a batch of probes. And that would be done either against a lab base or it'd be done against maybe a, a, a standard commercial probe, essentially, where you know what the, what the performance is. Okay. Um, this next one's going to challenge my Welsh uh, pronunciation. Uh, Griffith Jones, um, how robust are sensors using ion selective membranes? And how does this affect a sensor unit's longevity? Are they suitable for continuous monitoring over an extended period of time? So that's kind of the durability of the sensors themselves. Yeah. Uh, well, I think if you're looking for if you're looking for measuring the uh, ionic salts essentially, then you've got the issue of how to how the or getting the, the the right membrane for that application to be selective. Uh, the durability of that membrane is something which we would look to 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 develop as part of a project essentially, and we'd have to do tests on that. Uh, within this context of stream, uh, they, the, the ionic salts, i.e. the nitrates, we're looking to do those, uh, measure those by optical means rather than by electrochemical means. Okay, thank you very much, David. And um, so moving on to our next speaker now, uh, we're going to move over to Brian Olone um, from Board East Kimwara in the southeast of Ireland. So over to you, Brian. Okay, hopefully I'm in full screen mode there and hopefully you can see the camera. Yeah, so, see you perfectly. Thank you. Um, I work for BIM for the last 21 years in the southeast of Ireland and I cover shellfish aquaculture. Just get my little pointer option on the go there. And today I'd like to talk to you about the shellfish aquaculture in the region, its value and the range of monitoring work that I have undertaken in the past and the type of equipment used and also the monitoring constraints that you encounter. Some interesting findings and the, my own opinion on some of the performance of the equipment and also most importantly the pressures that are on the shellfish industry and what concerns they have and what type of sensors they would like to see for water quality in the future and maybe some take-home messages. So my region is the southeast of Ireland. I'm based in Wexford Town. I have an interest in anything that impacts on mussel seabed development. I have an interest in all of the catchments leading down into the shellfish bays. There is some freshwater aquaculture there, but other people in BIM cover that. So my bays um, start from Wexford in the east over to Ballymacoda in the west, which is in East County Cork. And mussels. Uh, in Wexford Harbour are the longest established since 1973. There are four oyster bays, Dungarvan, Valley Makota, Bano and Valley Teague. There's another mussel bay in Yall, and there's Waterford Estuary, which has oysters and mussels. And the product is being sold mussels to Holland and France. The better quality uh, mussels go to Holland in bulk, and oysters go in bulk to France and also to Europe. But more recently, they have being purified and packed by some of the bigger companies for the Asian market. So just to kind of look into some of the production areas in a little bit more detail. 
for Wexford Harbour, um, mussels are grown subtidally, roughly within the red areas. It's a highly dynamic uh, system in Wexford Harbour with moving channels and sandbanks. As I say, no mussels are cultivated on the sandbanks. Pressures would be from Wexford Town sewage system in terms of water quality and also from the big agricultural catchment draining into the Slaney and the producers access by dredgers and they need boats like that because they go out to sea to get seed mussel as well. Bano Bay is a sheltered intertidal bay for oyster farming and the oysters are grown in here. It's noted for its soft substratum, high productivity, and it's got uh, very meaty oysters, which are world famous. It's got a large agricultural rural area, and it's also got some pressures from small villages and septic tanks. Dungarvan Harbour is the largest oyster production bay in Ireland. It takes place on the White House Bank here. It's a more open bay exposed to the east. Pressures coming from Dungarvan Town sewage scheme and also from the Ring Helvig Peninsula, the sewage scheme. But as I say, tractors are, are, are accessible on all parts of the shore there. And there should be some work coming up with WIT with deployment of an exosond in Dungarvan. So we're looking at the tonnage of shellfish that are produced uh, using BIM figures of the last 10 years. Mussel exports have dropped in recent times due to curtailment of seed supply in the Irish Sea. Oysters were up at 4,000 tonnes at one point, but in recent times, in the last couple of years, we've had some mortalities and also the impact of the pandemic. So in terms of value, oysters are a higher value product. They can turn over 18 million a year, whereas mussels are considerably lower at around three, possibly four million per annum. And recent years, oysters affected more by mortalities and the pandemic than mussel farming. And that's just to kind of, I'll skim through that. That's just basically the production or the employment figures across the region for the two sectors. But it's important to say that in the Southeast is very important for mussel exports. They account for a large proportion of the national output and the oysters were at 50%, but they've kind of tapered off in recent years due to development of other oyster bays in the country. But apart from the economic turnover, um, you have direct, you also have some indirect uh, values and also ecosystem service values. I had to calculate these for a thesis uh, back in 2016 and 17. And these are really important for rural coastal communities, downstream jobs. And the ecosystem values are significant and shellfish are unique in the removal of nitrogen and phosphorus in particular. And th this is something that's probably going to become more important as the years go by. So in terms of the monitoring work that I have done in the region, it can be from very small deploying simple temperature loggers to scaling up deployment of loggers to data sons, to hydrographic studies for producers, spot monitoring, uh, bay scale hydrographic current meter deployments. And then the full uh, ensemble was the Ishka project, which involved a lot of people monitoring for several years and feeding the information into a team of academics who modeled shellfish growth in two of the bays in the region, that's Wexford Harbour and Dungarvan. These days, mostly my monitoring is confined to summer monitoring in oyster bays affected by above average mortalities. That's just for reference, that's the East Project Partners International Consortium. So in terms of the equipment that I use, tide gauges are essential, uh, tidbit temperature loggers from onset, salinity temperature and depth loggers from Star Audi. Uh, Datason 5X hydro, from Hydrolab, RCM9 current meters with um, salinity, pressure and temperature, as well as current speed and direction. Quad and trailer, some uh, spoke equipment for uh, mooring these items on the shore. Handhelds reader for the Datason and my trusty GPS, and also some customized equipment from the ISCA project. Apart from my own work, uh, I have colleagues, Nicholas Chopin from BIM will monitor for mussel bed development, seed bed development on the REC every year and report back to industry using the BIM survey vessel and he's using the side scan sonar. And they also track for larval movement of mussel larvae using the GPS enabled drone. 
I also have a colleague, Ronan Brown, who works on the Bluefish project. He has an exosond in the water here, taking readings and water sampling and growth studies, and that's in Bano, Waterford and Dungarvan. So some of the constraints that you run into, uh, anything involving divers is a nightmare from a red tape point of view. Anchoring equipment subtitly can be awkward as well. Intertidally, some sensors don't like exposure. You get more filing, in my experience. You also have general uh, administration issues with licenses and costs in boats and accessing parts of the bays, Wexford Harbour in particular. And weather is always a variable. Budget is a big one, and I do need more equipment. And hopefully, with this conference, we'll end up with cheaper sensors in the future. And the length of deployment uh, is crucial for some pieces of equipment. I used to have telemetry, but I don't have that now. And of course, you can ex expose the instruments to uh, accidental or deliberate damage. But in general, there's a scale of the production area is very big and a lot of widespread pressures. And we don't have enough sensors currently to capture all of that. This is just a kind of an image view of some of the issues. Divers, divers checking equipment subtitly, anchoring intertidally, hiring of boats, sometimes laboratory costs and bad weather. So some interesting findings that I maybe just touch on. My sensor uh, history started in Bano Bay in 2002, and I put a data saw on 4A in here with a telemetry box and solar panel. And this was on the main channel and the production area was here. And this was in response to high mortality events during the summer. And we found straight away that there were big spikes in oxygen during the day and drops during the night with the same shift in pH across the uh, oxygen profile, which was I'd never seen before at such a scale. And also there were freshwater influences where the freshwater was hanging around in that area and not draining away in deep tides. So we realized that this was a highly uh, stressed environment for the oysters and the producers applied for trial sites in the middle of the bay away from the channel, which proved very successful. And they now have full licenses there. And to this very day, the same producer will take his oysters away from the channel during the summer months and then bring them back up in the summer. And this way he has reduced his uh, mortality levels to a sustainable level. I think this is a good example of precision aquaculture. Also in the same bay, I was asked to just look at the, put the temperature loggers in the bags across the bay just to see when the seawater was coming into them. And we inadvertently discovered that oyster bags that didn't have any seaweed on them, they were new bags. The oysters were getting up to 33 degrees on a warm bank holiday in June, whereas oyster bags with seaweed cover had a more respectable 20 degree. And that led to huge temperature shifts between daytime and nighttime exposure. And these that's the period when the tide was in. So that was, that was causing a lot of stress on the oysters. And the recommendation there was to keep the seaweed on the bags during summer and then you can turn them after the summer to get rid of the seaweed. And that's been useful in lowering the stress of the oysters. In Dungarvan, the Isca project, some of the outputs, we had our hydrographic model and we had stronger currents here and weaker currents here. And our seed test sites grew well here and the larger oysters grew well here. And we also had a nice pulse of chlorophyll A incoming on the tide picked up by the data sound and our academics checked that out. And it was a pulse of benthic diatoms growing on the sand flats, which was a nice little boost for oyster growth. And they took that seriously because they, it's important input in the driver for their growth models. And also in Dungarvan, in more recent times, we had long periods of zero salinity on the northern edge of the production area. This is inner and this is outer towards the sea. These two sensors were 400 meters apart and they're picking this up uh, equally, and it's not happening in the southern sector. So there's some unusual freshwater influence happening up at the channel, which we've never seen before and which we look into again. That's just more details about that event for you for reference. So in terms of um, performance of monitoring equipment, um, tidbits and tide gauges are bulletproof, they're fantastic, long life and cheap. CTDs are in a similar category, although they can suffer from a bit of filing and clogging. And the data sounds are very good 
they're essential for chlorophyll and DO readings, although they do suffer from error readings in the chlorophyll, which you have to post process out. But the DO fluorescence was a really fantastic development on these machines, and they're good for handheld readings. The only big bugbear I have with them, if you get a sensor causing a problem, it can drain the battery and then everything fails during the deployment. The current meters were extremely robust and reliable, and I never had an issue with them until a tractor drove over one, which was a bit unfortunate. And basically, um, the problem we have here is that there's no real-time data and no alarms for industry. And these are the concerns that industry have. Micro microbial E. coli shellfish classification, they need a B or better to export. And that pressure comes from human, wildlife, or agriculture. And for oysters, norovirus levels uh, from human sources can impact on sales to Asia and depuration is required. And excessive mortalities can also be caused by herpes or vibrio microbial causes. In the Southeast, we don't have too many toxin issues, algal toxin issues, but there are out there unknown causes which undoubtedly have a problem for the industry. So what do the industry want? They want real-time monitoring with alarms and notifications throughout the year, not just in the summer. Better spread of monitoring across the production areas, which are quite big. More monitoring close to point pressures. Different priorities for each bay, such as Waterford Estuary. The producers have a concern about the impact of chlorine-produced oxidants on the ecosystem. And they also have an, in, an interest in turbidity due to dredging in the harbour. Dissolved oxygen is crucial to mussels and oysters. And the question is, can we develop sensors in the future for E. coli and norovirus to detect in the field? And we need cheaper sensors. So the take home messages are, we need to monitor to protect the shellfish rather than optimize quality currently. We need real time data with notifications for the industry. And we need a requirement for cheaper sensors and monitoring of maybe new parameters over greater areas. Thank you for your attention and I'll leave you with that picture. That's great Brian, thanks a million for that and um, thanks for highlighting just how important uh, aquaculture is to the southeast and I know from a personal note it's very important especially for people that have maybe lost jobs or lost employment um, from traditional capture fisheries. Um, yeah and we hope to develop um, cheaper um, and most importantly, more bulletproof sensors in the future. And uh, we'll definitely be looking to address all of those issues. And um, so we have a few questions from the audience. I'm um, just gonna go through them and just see where we are for time. And I'll get through as many as I can. Um, and then if, if we can't get through them all, if you can just uh, continue to talk away in the Q&A box, there's absolutely no problem with that. Okay, so the first question comes from Rod Wilson. Um, how do bivalves uh, contribute to CO2 uh, sequestra se sequestration, um, given that uh, they are net CO2 producers um, and methane too, and even more potent greenhouse gas? Okay, I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> Hello, Brian. Sorry, uh, I was just typing an answer on the Q&A. Sorry, All I right. thought you were asking somebody else a question. Or if you say it again, no, do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, no problem. So the question is, um, it's from Rod Wilson. How do bival bivalves contribute to CO2 sequestration um, given they are net CO2 producers and methane too, and even more potent greenhouse gas? Um, from the, the literature that I've reviewed on the carbon sequestration, it's, uh, it's a 50-50 uh, divide between what the academics think. And uh, I did emphasize that most of the services, that the most important ones are nutrient removal from nitrogen and phosphorus. But some academics do believe, there's research from Australia that do put a figure on carbon sequestration, but it's a highly contested issue uh, in shellfish uh, ecosystem services. Okay, that's no problem. Um, and like I said, look, if pe people have any questions, if you can continue, Brian will be happy to answer them in the Q&A box if he has time. Um, we're just coming up to the break now. Um, sorry, just one second. So we're just going to take a short break now uh, and we will return back at, um, at 11.20. So um, for the next... Uh, 
speakers in the next one. So you have the agenda up there in front of you and I hope that you'll all come back and join us. I think at one stage we had 140 participants there. So that's absolutely fantastic. I look forward to seeing every single one of those people back for the next uh, speakers. Thank you very much.
Welcome back. I hope you had a nice break for coffee and stretching a bit. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for participating in this webinar and I want to thank all the speakers. We are now start, starting our next, um, next uh, session in the agenda. Uh, we are still in Ireland. We're going to start with Paul Shanahan from the National Maritime College of, of Ireland. So Paul, if, uh, if you're there, uh, you, can, you can share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you, Paul. I think Paul is trying to get his screen yeah. working. Perfect. I can see you clearly. And now we can move on to this. Uh, it's a presentation about the coastal monitoring radar. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I shared the wrong screen. Yep. Uh, yeah, we can see it. All right. All right. Um. Sorry, I've lost it here in a second. Uh, and we can see your screen. It's not on presentation mode yet, but... Um, oh, can you see my screen? Yeah, because I've lost... Um, we can see the first... Yes, perfect. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry. Perfect, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, typical, typical. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, as Sarah said, I'm uh, Paul Shannon from the National Maritime College in Ireland. I work in the, uh, the Health and Research Centre there. Uh, we do all um, maritime research for um, the National Maritime College. And uh, just for anyone who uh, wouldn't be aware, uh, we are also one of the colleges of um, the Munster Technological University, previously CIT, just, just in case uh, anyone missed that one as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk today uh, about um, our involvement in the STREAM project. Um, and uh, it was mentioned earlier on by, um, by David and uh, Carlos, uh, we're a partner, a full partner in this project. And uh, one of Halpin's um, roles in the project uh, would be deploying sensors similar to what the other partners are doing in, um, in Waterford and in Swansea. And we've been deploying similar sensors for monitoring of um, you know, water quality. And we will also be deploying um, weather stations um, to, to back up those um, sensors. Uh, we're also going to be developing a, a pumping system, which will allow us um, hopefully to take uh, large samples um, uh, from the water without actually removing the water um, in the similar way that uh, spat bags are used to take samples. Uh, we're going to use this system, which will have a much bigger uh, capacity to absorb um, biological materials. So we, the idea is we'll pump a lot of water uh, through uh, our pumping system and we'll hopefully get a large uh, biological um, sample from, from the water that's pumped through. The pump will also contain a, a number of sensors, which will allow us to identify uh, whether there's any biological material there of interest for us that we want to uh, take the sample uh, in the first place. So it's a, it'd be more active than uh, SPAT, you know, SPAT being a more uh, passive uh, sampling uh, system. Um, we're also deploying uh, coastal monitoring radar stations, and uh, I'll talk about them a little bit more. Uh, we will also be developing a social media platform which will uh, allow us to um, disseminate the information that's gathered from uh, our own uh, sensors and the other partner sensors also, which will be quite a big task. Uh, we're also working with the Department of Physical Sciences in um, MTU, uh, Dr. Ambrose Fiori and Dr. Uh, Nagma Kamali, um, and they will be involved in sampling and testing um, a sampling and testing program from samples that will be recovered from the pumping system, which is their concept, and uh, the applied sensors, which uh, they are heavily involved in uh, for the procurement of. And as, as we said earlier, that um, we're the three partners are using pretty much the same uh, off the shelf sensors in, in the first instance. So, our coastal um, monitoring radar uh, solution. Uh, I suppose anyone, you know, who takes part in an outdoor activity in Ireland would be well aware that, um, you know, the first thing we do is keep one eye on the weather. 
Uh, and in Ireland, that generally means uh, what is the rainfall doing at the moment. Uh, so it's quite important to know, um, you know, if, if you are taking part in outdoor activity, uh, the conditions that exist, you know, I mean, if you're going for a run, you would have a look out, out the window and you would dress appropriately. Coastal communities, you know, are, are they're in the same boat. Um, you know, anyone who goes to sea uh, for work or for leisure uh, will also keep an eye on the weather. Um, it's, it's very important. Uh, quite often lives depend on it. Um, you know, if you pay attention to the weather, uh, you understand the conditions, you can take the appropriate actions um, to, you know, to take part in your uh, work or your leisure in, in a safer manner. Um, you know, so, I, I mean, even in this, in one instance, you know, it could be a case that, you know, you're, you see the weather conditions and you might decide, well, I just won't go to sea today, you know, especially for people involved in the leisure industry, which would be very important that you wouldn't actually go to sea. Uh, a bit more difficult for people who are working at sea, of course. Um, so our, our local um, monitoring, coastal monitoring radar station, what we're doing with it in the main is um, monitoring rainfall. And this will obviously add to the, the accurate local weather information for, you know, just a particular uh, coastal area. And um, <clears throat> um, the, once we get um, our uh, local weather information uh, up and running, we will be going to a situation like what Sophia and uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, real-time monitoring. And I will show an example of that um, uh, later on. Um, Currently, the, the National Weather Rainfall Radar uh, is, the picture is made up from two different uh, inputs, and one is the radar site in Shannon Airport, and the other one is the, the um, radar site in Dublin Airport, but also added into them to, to create our full national picture um, is the, weather sta the radar station in Belfast and a radar station in Swansea. And that uh, allows uh, Met Aaron to build the picture for the Irish uh, rainfall you know, as, it, as it progresses through the country. Um, they are also going to build that network to include um, a new station in, um, in the northwest of the country and another one in the south of the country. And that will improve um, the, the picture overall. So um, all, all the information then that we gather um, will be put onto our uh, social media platform and hopefully uh, add to the picture of the, the overall picture in the country. But what it will also do is um, increase, um, increase the ra rain detection in uh, areas that would be black spots essentially, areas where the radars, uh, the national radars don't see. But we can also just provide these radars in, um, in local communities to uh, give a local community uh, a, a real accurate, up-to-date, uh, real-time picture of what the conditions are in your location at any given time. And hopefully, you know, as, as I said, this will be disseminated on the social media platform so you have access to this um, at 24 hours a day. The radar that we're using is um, it's a commercially available uh, off-the-shelf uh, Halo 6 radar, it's a Simrad uh, radar. You can see the radar range there between 75 metres and 72 nautical miles. Uh, uh, regularly seen on small yachts uh, on medium-sized vessels and uh, you can see there it has a weather and a bird mode also so you can track birds with it. We currently have um, a radar station deployed in, in Fort Davis in Cork Harbour and it's been there for uh, since April of 2018. Uh, it's battery powered and uh, you can see the battery box here and all the electronics in it. That battery box has been changed and it's currently operating two batteries and we're going to uh, upgrade it pretty soon to three batteries in, in order for us to be able to run the radar 24 hours a day. Um, it, the radar itself, or the batteries themselves then, are recharged in wind and uh, solar. And uh, we're currently detecting rainfall out to approximately 35 kilometres at the moment, getting really good pictures uh, out to 35 kilometres. We can see it beyond that, but the picture isn't as, as accurate. 
So where are we going to deploy our radars? Um, Fort Davis, as I said, is our, our first uh, test site. It's been there for uh, a number of years now. It's operating really well, though it isn't operating 24 hours a day just yet. Um, so we need to uh, upgrade that before we uh, make the deployments for streams. So um, we'll be deploying to Kilmore Key uh, in this building here in Kilmore, Kilmore Key. We're putting one on the roof here um, later in the summer. And um, it's, this is delayed by COVID it also should have been deployed last year. Um, we are also deploying in Swansea in uh, 2022, um, maybe on the university campus in Swansea. Um, potential for other deployments, we're in negotiations with one of the stakeholders in the project who may uh, purchase another radar, um, depending on how the Kilmore Key deployment goes, and that will also be deployed somewhere in the Wexford region, a, a, a location to be uh, selected by that uh, stakeholder. Um, so we're also in um, we're also in discussions with um, a, a national partner as well. We put in a proposal for two more radars, which we will also deploy on the south coast of Ireland. So this is um, typical uh, radar screenshot of what we're detecting, um, and what you're looking at here. Um, I'll just bring up a, a pointer. So what we're looking at here is um, this is uh, Cork Harbour, the entrance to Cork Harbour here, this is where our radar is located. And what we're really interested in here is what we, I would, I've circled in this image here, and that is actually rainfall that's uh, approaching from the southwest. Um, the different colours in here, uh, the blue is light rain, green is heavier, and red is heavier again. So over the next few slides, I will just um, move forward and you'll be able to see the rain tracking to the, the northeast. And um, that's pretty much what we're looking for. Um, these images are taken uh, to a series of stills uh, every three minutes over the course of um, 12 minutes. And uh, so you can see the progression of the, the rainfall towards uh, uh, Cork Harbour here. So you can just see it moving uh, in a northwesterly or northeasterly direction um, up over Cork Harbour. And if I just back it up there again, and um, and you can see also uh, does it's getting more red, more red images here, which means that the rain is, is starting to, to dump, and uh, it's getting a lot of green in here now as well. And that's um, that's pretty much what we will be. Um, uh, disseminating on the platform something similar to this in it'll be a series of still pictures over a period of um, you know a, a few minutes between each uh, image because uh, it would take a lot of data to um, to have a live uh, feed of, of the actual radar image okay I think that's me done yep thank you, thank you very much thank you Paul that was very very interesting Sorry. That's fine. Thank you. That is very, very interesting. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment, um, but I, I would like to ask uh, one question, actually. You, you were saying that this is going to be shared on social media, but I suppose then you also have the data collated and collected and recorded somewhere else so that you can actually analyze that data and, and make predictions, I suppose. Yeah, um, I, I'm not the expert in it now, but uh, it will be yeah, collected and stored in the, uh, the, the data center in Waterford IT. Okay. And uh, the, we have two, um, we have two uh, computer, computer scientists who are working on the data who will transfer it into usable information and it'll be, it'll be um, added into the social media platform. Out of curiosity, how much does a system like this cost? <laughs> um, the radar itself currently is costing um, it currently costs uh, just over seven thousand euros. Uh, we'll also require a license to manipulate the software, and uh, that's currently uh, fifteen hundred euros. Um, but to put the system in place, um, wind, solar, batteries, and communications links, and so on, uh, currently it is around fifteen to eighteen thousand euros. Okay. Um, but our deployment in 
uh, Kilmore Key uh, won't require batteries and it won't require a communications link because we're because we're putting it on the building. They are allowing us to um, feed into their own power supply and also feed into their communications network. So the information will be transferred over the internet um, back to the MTU. But at the moment, this means that the data will be available, and uh, you know, uh, aquaculture fishermen, everyone near the where your station is, your radar is, can have access to this data through social media. That, that's that's the plan to to have it accessed uh, locally. So, but 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 you don't have to be local to access it. So, if the net, as the network gets bigger, you know, it's so will so will the usage of the social media platform. It would be the intention. That is fantastic, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I will now move on to the next uh, presentation. Actually, we will have three speakers for the next presentation. Um, uh, here from the Aquaculture at the Center of Sustainable Aquatic Research. Uh, so we are going to present my colleagues uh, how we are using sensors in, in our center of research. And Paul, I suppose, is going to share his screen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. The floor is yours. If you can uh, share your, your camera, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Paul. We can see your screen. It's not yet on presentation mode. There we go. Can you hear me as well? We can hear you, we can see you, and we can see your presentation. You're good to go. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, my name is Paul Howes. I'm the manager of the Centre for Sustainable Aquatic Research at Swansea University. Uh, I'm just going to overview of our facilities, what we do, uh, and then pass on to Pete and Josh, who are some of our uh, key researchers who will talk about some of the work they're doing as well. So we're created in order to um, it, deliver a, a unique teaching experience for uh, our students. Uh, we have a, a range of different undergrad students who come in to use the facilities every year and get hands-on practical experience in uh, aquaculture and aquatic science. And we also, obviously, as a research centre, one of our key drivers is to deliver impactful research. Um, we've also got a, a, we were originally established in 2003 in order to uh, help to boost the sector within Wales. It was, CESA was funded through the Welsh Government, the EU and Swansea University. So we work really closely with a, a range of different industry colleagues from, from throughout the UK and further afield as well. So we have a range of expertise within CESAR. Uh, some, of the, some of the areas we really focus on are welfare and aquaculture and aquatic research, as well as larval culture and algal biotechnology. I'll go on to that in a, in a minute as well. Epigenetics, we have a large group uh, studying epigenetics and the environmental impacts of aquaculture as well. Quite a lot of ecosystem modeling. And one of the main drivers as well for the development within CESAR is uh, the aquaculture hatchery technologies, which you've obviously seen a number of talks previous today who are either working with CESAR or are part of the network that we, uh, that we engage with. So the facilities at CESAR, we've uh, spent the last five years developing them. There's been over a million pound invested to upgrade and modernize all of the different areas within CESAR. You see some of the images there. Uh, we have 16 dedicated aquatic research laboratories. These include uh, 13 different RAS systems, so recirculating aquaculture systems, from small systems that are only a couple of cubic meters, all the way up to uh, the image in the top right-hand corner of the screen, which is around 60 meters cubed volume. Uh, we've produced around 2 million lumpfish in that facility, in that particular room uh, over the last four or five years as well. So we've got a number of uh, rack system zebrafish or killifish racks as well for doing different sorts of behavioral studies and welfare studies there. We've recently also got a CRISPR lab uh, for doing genetically modified organisms as well. And we're diversifying into aquaculture, uh, aquaponics and hydroponics as well. All of the rooms are temperature controlled. So as we mentioned earlier with the sensor technology, not only do you have to know what changes are happening within a system, you also have to be able to maintain optimal parameters for the fish. We've recently opened a large um, new facility, which is called the Wales ACE Aquaculture Centre of Excellence. That's uh, looking at multi-trophic aquaculture. Uh, it's basically a range of different sized tanks to have a full uh, hatchery scale from broodstock to, uh, to uh, hatching cones. And it's also linked to uh, industry-sized uh, photo uh, 
bio bioreactors as well. This is part of the algae D as well. They they were kind enough to help install that particular biofence. So the idea being that we're investing in this in circular economy and doing research in the circular economy to look at how waste from fish can be used to grow microalgae, which can then be processed into feeds to in turn provide either full diets or diet supplements to fish. So we've got some of the largest uh, algal biotechnology uh, facilities in of any uh, HEI in Europe. So it's ranging from very small batch culture and master cultures to uh, biofences as well. So there's a number of different images there that you can see the sort of scale. Uh, we believe that excellence and welfare equals uh, robust research data. So in order to support that, we have the university named Animal Care and Welfare Officer. We have a fish vet who's a fish specialist who comes in once a week to check over the fish and give us advice on, on future, future direction for ensuring good uh, biosecurity within the, within the facilities and high welfare standards. And we also have a dedicated animal welfare technician who works with any students who are within the within the, the, the facilities or any researchers to make sure that the welfare of the animals is, is optimized at all times. So within CESAR, like many uh, recirculating aquaculture systems, we monitor a range of different parameters, such as the air temperature, water temperature, salinity, pH, oxygen, carbon dioxide, ozone, et cetera. Uh, obviously within, within our systems, we also have to be able to monitor these and be alerted if these change or vary. So everything is backed up by, by alarm systems. So that's, that's CESAR in a nutshell, um, but we're trying to see how these sensors that are either currently in use within aquaculture and aquatic research and sensors that are coming onto the market, how they can be integrated into new sectors or expanded within the current sectors. So I'm just going to go through a few projects that we're, we're delivering at the moment that we see sensor technology is playing a key role in. So as I mentioned before, within the Wales ACE, um, the, the building that is looking at reusing fish waste to, to spike microalgae, we're looking at ways to develop sensor technology between the trophic levels so we can monitor the nitrites, the nitrates, the ammonia, uh, and other parameters that are being produced and see how that changes depending on what diet is being fed to the fish. And as you can see throughout this circular economy loop there in the bottom left hand corner, we envisage sensor technology being placed at, at four of the key main areas within the within the cycle. Uh, within within um, international development, we're working with a number of partners and different companies to try and develop how sensors can be used to integrate into low income countries and marginal environments. Uh, obviously, at the, at the moment, sensor technology is at such a, a level for when it comes to expense that many stakeholders globally just can't, can't uh, benefit from the use of sensors because of the price. So that, um, that project, uh, Pufferfish project, is looking at ways that uh, we can again get the most out of the circular economy and reuse waste from fish to grow microalgae, which is then used to, to boost the, the, the microalgae, uh, my, the algal oil levels of the omega-3s and things like that of the fish that are being consumed in some of these countries. Uh, lastly, before I move on to some of our researchers who can talk about their research, we have another project that's uh, recently been funded. This is uh, another area where we see sense technology playing a key role, which is within the biophilic sector. So within Swansea city centre, uh, they're just starting to put boots on ground and shovels into the ground uh, to develop what's called the Picton Yard project. This is going to have aquaculture within the, within the lower floors of the building. The aquaculture, waste from the aquaculture will then be processed through membrane technology in order to produce fertilizers for growing plants in aquaponics and vertical greenhouses within the different uh, stories of the building. All of the people living within the building or renting the commercial space, space will form what's known as a community investment company, and they will manage the, the, the production of the actual building over the next five years. We see this as a test bed for for, for research, a test bed for how communities within city centres can, can be uh, invested in the circular economy, invested in food security, and also low carbon technology. So a, a range of uh, photovoltaic panels and photovoltaic, photovoltaic paint will be used 
and we see sense technology as a way to you know to 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 allow the public to see what is happening within the within the lungs of of of, of this particular building. So I'll pass on now to uh, Pete and Josh, who will talk about some of the research that's uh, got ongoing and planned within CESAR as well. So thank you very much. I am uh, Peter Jones, and I'm working as a postdoc on the STREAM project. Um, and I'm going to be doing some work to determine the temperature preference and avoidance uh, thresholds for uh, a range of marine organisms. Um, we have these shuttle box setups in uh, CESAR, and they allow for um, choice experiments for a range of uh, fish and crustaceans. And uh, basically you can manipulate um, water quality to high precision on uh, either side of the shuttle boxes. And um, the organisms within them can detect differences at the interface between the two sides of the box and uh, can shuttle back and forth to control their ambient conditions. And using um, overhead cameras, you monitor their movements and over time you can determine their temperature preferences. Um, next slide when you can, Paul. Um, initially, we're gonna be uh, working with juvenile sea bass, um, but we're, we're considering a range of other species and if anyone has any suggestions for uh, species that might be of particular interest, then please let us know. Um, uh, we're gonna be working with temperature initially, but um, there's also potential to work on uh, dissolved oxygen, pH, uh, CO2 concentrations and uh, salinity. Um, and the output data will be um, the preference uh, range for different species as well as their lower and upper um, avoidance thresholds and um, this data should be useful for identifying areas with suitable water parameters for aquaculture and also for predicting how um, habitat suitability and species distributions are likely to change uh, with respect to predicted uh, climate change and that's where Josh's work comes in so I'll pass you over to him. Thanks, Pete. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh. I'm the, the other postdoc at CESAR. Uh, I know we've not got much time, so I'll be brief. Um, essentially, uh, we will look at the um, so some of the impacts of climate change on uh, fisheries and agriculture in the ROC. Um, so, quickly, how we how we uh, envisage we'll do this is um, using things like uh, dynamic energy budget models and. Uh, and uh, other statistical models we will use um, current um, distributions of fish and agriculture target species and we'll build models um, where we take in things like the bathymetry, chlorophyll and lots of other similar things that have been mentioned earlier today um, particularly some uh, parameters being recorded by stream and we'll use these to kind of drive models to uh, help us understand where these species are and what those parameters are that drive them. Uh, next, next slide, please, Paul. And what we'll then do is um, use those, those predictions for, um, for current distributions and take, take uh, environmental data from, from some time in the past, uh, as far back as we can get it. And then we use that to model uh, the current um, current population distributions uh, or suitability envelopes, uh, habitat envelopes for different species in fisheries and, ac and agriculture. And then we can see how that matches up with what we, the data we have on these um, known distributions. So then we can get an idea of how good our models are. Um, and then we can apply that model that we've now validated to um, predictions in uh, changes in, in all the things like temperature and uh, salinity and any sorts of uh, chlorophyll distribution as well that might change with um, habitat, uh, sorry, with climate change. Um, and then we can also calibrate these models um, with the mesocosm experiments that Peter was just talking about. Uh, next slide. So once, once we have this model um, that we validated on, on current distributions, uh, 
we can we can run all sorts of different um, the model on all sorts of different climate change scenarios. Um, so we can do something very similar to this this study that looked at Pacific oyster cultivation, um, and we can look at where there might be um, more opportunities for um, industry uh, inshore agriculture or maybe even um, different places that haven't been uh, suitable before. Um, and hopefully with um, increased resolution uh, with lots of lots more of the, the, the cheaper printed sensors that stream is going to produce, we can get a, a higher resolution image of where um, there might be changes in site suitability and, and things going on in the future. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, uh, Paul, uh, Pete, and Josh. Thank you for the three of you and for having such a smooth transition in between speakers and for giving us a good insight about um, what's uh, happening in, in the Center for Sustainable Aquatic Research and uh, the capabilities the, the, that we have in terms of, of research in this area. We don't have questions and actually we are just uh, that I can oh, and say, oh, I have something here. Uh, so many thanks for the fascinating talk. Uh, this is from Rod Wilson. I'm interested in what uh, um, CO2 carbon dioxide pressure sensors you use and how reliable you find them. I don't know if, if Pete, you can uh, answer this question or Paul. Uh, uh, we. I, I'm not using uh, carbon dioxide sensors apart from when we produce uh, microalgae within rooms. So we have uh, emergency alarm sensors for if carbon dioxide levels get too high. Uh, but it is something that we would like to look at because within the Picton Yard um, development that I mentioned, mm. they, they're looking at ways to recycle the waste carbon dioxide produced by the residents of the building in order to be pumped into the any of the greenhouses for, for plant growth at certain times of the day? Um, there, so there, there is potential to, uh, to measure the CO2 in those shuttle tanks I was talking about. Um, I'm afraid I'm not a, a sensor expert, uh, but my understanding is that it's derived from uh, pH um, in those, uh, that's the way of monitoring CO2 in those illegal shuttle tanks. Um, but I'll, I'll look into it and get back to you if that's all right. Thank you, Pete. Uh, we are running a bit out of time. There is still one question there, but I'll let you answer that question uh, on, that, on the Q&A uh, chat box. So we are going to move, and thank you again, and we're going to move to the next speaker, um, uh, Geopar Alex, who's uh, coming from the company Faptic. Uh, thank you, Geopar. She's going to present uh, reverse engineering, uh, machine vision solution for aquaculture. So whenever you're ready, thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, can you see my screen and do you hear me? You're good to go. We can see your screen and your camera. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, firstly, I would thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate at this conference. Um, so I'm Jopa Relakas and uh, I'm data scientist at the FAPTIC. Uh, so uh, needless to say that we live in the information age, so we should take advantage of these new technologies in order to easily solve uh, previously difficult problems. So the FAPTIC uh, intends to apply machine vision and deep learning techniques to develop fish behavior analytical services and data for the global aquaculture industry. Uh, our launch product focuses on numb fish, uh, which is used in the salmon farming sector. And in the course of time, uh, we uh, intend to uh, add other uh, species and commercial applications to our product. Uh, given the opportunity to, by the Swansea University, um, we discovered some of the burning questions of the industry, and we looked at the technical solutions to answer them. And in this presentation, uh, I will discuss two of the most interesting questions. And uh, I will try to trace back from the answer to the actual technical solution behind it. So uh, the first uh, question would be, where did the field go? And for that, we, um, we propose to represent it like a 3D graph 
uh, in which we can see uh, where the fish are swimming or where they stay inside the water bodies. And uh, this inspection get, can give some insight into fish behavior and represent the fish distribution in the water. So for example, it can be easily detected if the fish are aggregated on some specific part of the uh, water body. So uh, for that, um, here you can see um, the process backwards. So let's see from, uh, from the visualization to actually how we do that. And um, so here you can see that some of the parts of the water are marked with, uh, uh, with red. And for that, uh, uh, we use as a threshold um, some value, um, be, uh, which can differentiate between low and high density of fish. And this is done in the reverse process of step two. Step two sorry. So, um, but also for to, um, to define these uh, densities, uh, we need to uh, inspect those regions over time and uh, averaging the number of fish in specific regions. Um, and um, also for counting the fishes in some regions of water, we need to know the limits of the specific regions and also the position of fish. And uh, all these steps are based on the very last uh, uh, step in this solution, which is the most important, and is to have a detection algorithm uh, which can detect the land fish in the underwater video recordings. And how we do that? Um, so for detecting the fish, we use uh, deep learning algorithms. And uh, as a result from these algorithms, we will know the position of the fish in, uh, in a 2D uh, position. And uh, in order to also know the fish position in 3D, um, we, uh, we make recordings by stereo uh, stereoscopic cameras, uh, meaning that we have um, recordings from the same field of view from slightly different angles, and uh, it makes possible to reconstruct the scene in 3D. Um, okay, and to simplify the, the final results and the presentation, we propose to, um, to split this uh, entire water volume into subunits, let's say, and here you can see um, an example for that. And uh, as a result, each region can be identified by the coordinates of the eight corners of them. And uh, by also knowing the position of the fish, which was uh, previously uh, calculated, uh, we can easily number the, uh, we, we can easily count the fish inside each of the regions. And uh, we can use uh, those numbers in the final representation. Uh, so finally, um, we are making all these measurements over multiple time, and we are averaging the numbers inside each uh, unit volume. And uh, at the at the uh, end of the process, we can uh, uh, choose some thresholds above what we can uh, we can highlight the regions which are crowded. Let's say where the uh, where the number of fish is higher. Okay, and uh, so let's talk about also about the, um, the second questions. It is very specific to the lungfish, uh, and uh, uh, the lungfish has the behavior named clinging uh, when uh, the fish is resting by being stick to flat surfaces. And um, uh, we want to uh, visualize this uh, behavior as a percentage compared to the swimming. Uh, fish and cleaning fish. So uh, for this, we also use the reverse approach. So in order to have this visualization about the proportion of fish swimming and uh, clinging, uh, we need to know the number, the actual number of those fish. And uh, for calculate these numbers, we, we do the steps from three to five. Um, and uh, we have the assumption that the fish is clinging if the position in the current uh, video frame uh, is the same as the, in the frame before. Uh, otherwise, uh, we consider that uh, that fish is swimming. 
So in summary, uh, in order to identify the clinging behavior, we will track the position of the fish. Uh, here you can see that um, the first part is to detect and localize of the fish in the video frames. And uh, this gives us uh, a fish identification number and the bounding box around it. Um, so um, the location where the fish was detected. And this uh, information will be further used in our tracking algorithm. And um, here you can see uh, the whole process where the object is detected in frame number one, and uh, it will be represented as the centroid of the location where it was founded. And in the next steps, uh, in the next frame, we will use a predictor algorithm which, which can uh, uh, predict the uh, new position of the fish based on where it was before. And we also use another algorithm to ensure that in the consecutive frames, we identify the same fish. And uh, from this algorithm, we will have the fish IDs and their positions uh, during the, the recordings. Okay, and um, so as I mentioned before, we assume that uh, when a fish has, uh, uh, when a fish didn't, uh, change its position that uh, means it is clinging and otherwise if the position was changed during these recordings then the fish is clinging and here you see uh, you can see a very short presentation so here we mark two fish with the id 9 and 11 and uh, in these frames you can see that the fish uh, 11 is, is uh, moving um, meanwhile, the, uh, the fish with ID9 is tagged on the bottom of the tanks. Okay. And uh, as a conclusion, I can say that machine vision is already here, uh, opening new ways to solve uh, difficult problems. And uh, it has many advantages, like it is always available and is non-invasive and it can be predictive. Uh, and uh, in the future, we intend to focus more on the fish behavior analysis part and uh, how to monitor also the fish welfare. And uh, thank you for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jopar. That's a, an interesting presentation. Um, I have a, a question here. I just wanted to, to highlight that um, the images you show are in a tank environment, actually, in um, at the Center of Sustainable Aquatic Research. But uh, I have a question here uh, uh, regarding, you know, you're capturing these images and then you analyze them and you're able to, uh, in this case, for instance, that you showed to uh, access the behavior for the lumpfish in particularly, they can cling, they have a suction disc. Or they can swim, but do you need to to look at the entire volume of water? How does this work for you to be able to to create all this data? Okay, so currently, as uh, you see, uh, I just go back to the slides. So as you see, if, uh, if we are using only one camera, the the volume of water is really limited. What we what we see, but using multiple cameras, we can extend this uh, field of view, and also we can include some exit points uh, from where the uh, the fish exits. It's uh, the field of view of the camera, and we include also there. So I have a question here from Maria Filipa Castaneira, uh, and she's saying, very informative, uh, do you think it is possible to use a technology on a commercial scale, that is, uh, understand the swimming behavior and the patterns of lumpfish in a, in a salmon cage, so uh, where you have two different species, right? It's salmon and the lumpfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that case, we will use, um, we will train another model, which will be able to also identify the salmons. And then uh, we will, uh, um, I mean, we intend to, um, to analyze both of the, the species and also try to find that uh, specific events when the lungfish is uh, eating sea lice from the salmon. But for that, we will need additional data to have. Uh, 
as always, it seems like the calibration and getting data is uh, is a very key and a sometimes limiting factor. But uh, I'm sure you'll be able to carry on with the research and collect more more data to do this. Um, I have no more questions, and we are right on time to go to move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Gilbert, for your very interesting presentation. So our next speaker um, is Christian Berger from Pebble, that is Plant Ecology Beyond Land. And he will be presenting Sea Lenses uh, Technology to mon Monitor 3D Aquaculture in Wales. Um, Christian, thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Zara. Can you see my screen and hear me OK? Totally fine. Good to go. OK, cool. So uh, my name is Christian. I'm originally from Swansea, uh, but I've lived in different places. And about two years ago, we set up uh, Pebble, Plant Ecology Beyond Land, with the aim to support low trophic aquaculture, mostly focusing on seaweeds, but also on, on shellfish. And we are in the business of both doing cultivation of seaweeds and doing monitoring in the marine environment. So today I'm gonna to give you an overview of what we have worked on so far on the monitoring side of things. And on the right-hand side, you can see some images of some of the tests we've conducted so far. So just to give a background, <laughs> um, some of the speakers have already outlined some of the nice things about precision aquaculture. And when we started looking at how we can develop um, monitoring equipment for sea farmers or low trophic aquaculture companies, we spoke to lots of different farmers and the key things that came back on these consultations is that people want to reduce the risk and that's both setting up a new farm and managing their existing farm. They want to improve consistency and they want to reduce the manual labor. So here on the top right, you've got uh, images of a typical application scenario. So this is a seaweed farm on the left where you've got a string of seaweeds growing off a rope about one to 1 1.5 meters depth. And uh, similarly, shellfish uh, can grow in, in a slightly different configuration, but also on a line in the sea. So we want to develop these tools to allow people to assess new locations for this type of aquaculture. Uh, we want them to allow them to schedule and plan harvests and to give them early warnings and troubleshooting in case there is a disease, rigging failure, or pollution events. But more, most importantly, we think it's about validating sustainability objectives. So a lot of the people going into seaweed farming and shellfish farmer farming are strong believers in that these can be a means to producing food in a way that's sustainable. And in order to validate those proof and you know, to, to, to verify that you are doing so, we need evidence that this is the case. So the reality we came up against is that most sea farmers are actually very small organizations. I think I, think I read a statistic that 80% of the UK sort of uh, marine aquaculture businesses are less than five or less people. And that means because they're small groups, they don't have big budgets and they mostly rely on government organizations, grants, and university collaborations in order to get their monitoring done. So we came across many organizations that aren't near a university, you know, that aren't wised up to be able to write neat grant applications. So this means that we need to democratize precision aquaculture for these organizations if we want to allow our low trophic sea farms to grow. So our approach to this is to simplify all the different parameters that we can measure and we grouped it into two key units. So we were looking at one unit that does your basic environmental monitoring and that includes measuring salinity, the light, and in this case we're looking at the light attenuation. And I know we've mentioned uh, turbidity is, is a sort of analogous factor to that looking at temperature and temperature variation through the water column and flow or the velocity of the current in the water. 
And for shellfish and seaweeds, these are really crucial factors. Of course, there's other things as well, like dissolved oxygen and pH that are equally important, but we are just at the beginning of, of developing something. And the things we keep in mind here is we want to keep things as low cost as possible. We want to make them easy to use and we want them to be, in a sense, repairable and replaceable. So our current configuration is essentially a, a data buoy, which has a data capture and power unit on the surface. And dropping off that is at 0.5 meters, a light and temperature sensor. And then at 1.5 meter depth, another light and temperature sensor. So we can look at the difference there. In order to measure flow, we're using a tilt current sensor. And that's essentially a, a a weighted or a buoyant pattern that has an accelerometer and gyrometer inside it that measures the tilt due to the current. Another really important part of imaging your sea farm, or understanding your sea farm rather, is imaging. And there's two things um, we can do here. For one, we can take accurate images that allows us to see whether there are diseases forming, whether we can see grazers or epiphytes, epiphytes meaning other things growing on the surface of your cultivated species. But also video is important because it tells you whether there's anything wrong with the sea farm, has anything broken? Is there any wearing or grinding going on as the sea farm is moving around? So these two units we see as the two sort of priority units that we want to develop. So we have a case study which we, where we conducted some initial uh, experiments using our system. And this was actually not in Wales, it was in, in Scotland. Um, and that's simply something that came up out of discussions with the different uh, uh, organizations. And there's a group called Climavore who have previously been doing educational events about uh, shellfish and seaweed food as a form of sustainable food. And they are proposing to create an intertidal farm. Um, I believe this is the first of the kind. And the idea is to integrate both shellfish and seaweed in the intertidal range. And rather than having a monoculture crop, you're trying to have a sort of market garden concept in the intertidal range. And this is quite, um, uh, I guess, suitable for the Scottish locks because they're huge number of lochs that have this really gradual intertidal range which is, which is very sheltered. So we looked at three different sites um, and we characterized these uh, basically the first site was a sheltered cove near a small stream, the second site was a semi-exposed bay facing south uh, but near a hotel and the third site was on a wide loch and was quite a deep site. So we First of all, compared the three different sites, we measured the same data just at the low tide point on the same day. And with our equipment, we found that, first of all, salinity varies between all three sites. And this was sort of in line with what we expect, um, depending on the amount of scouring or, I guess, water exchange we expect with the, with the deep sea. So, for example, on the, the very first sheltered bay was uh, lower salinity, so we expect more influence from fresh water running off the hills. Interestingly, in the second site, we found a small spike in salinity round about lunchtime, and we, we think we may be able to attribute this to the septic tank. So the hotel that's nearby is actually a, a really big hotel, and you can almost see a sort of milky, streaky liquid coming down from the bank next to the hotel. So that was something to note for assessing the site suitability. Um, and for light attenuation and current speed, those we found are actually correlating to some extent. So the light attenuation we're measuring across the three sites varied depending on how murky or how turbid the water was. And we clearly saw that the, the more exposed site, which was actually near sort of mud flat substrate had a much more turbid substrate and therefore would, would affect which shellfish and seaweed you could grow. And this, uh, this hypothesis, I guess, was backed up by the current data. 
So we measured a much higher current in site two and site three using our tilt meter. So in terms of concluding from this site suitability assessment, um, the community group decided that site two and site three are most suitable, although sites three would be too turbid for some species to grow, um, especially some of the, uh, the kelps, which they hope to grow at the low tide mark, may not actually grow because there's too much turbidity. Um, obviously, there's a, some level of concern about site two because the, we discovered that there's, there's this uh, effect on the salinity due to the septic tank. We probably need more data to support that hypothesis and the scope to move further out of the bay, get away from the influence. But this is just to demonstrate that our initial prototype system was able to make some, give, give some value to this organization. So what are our next steps? So this first case study was just simply deploying the tools in the open uh, intertidal area. We now want to adapt these tools for sea farms. And there's a lot of questions about how you mount to a sea farm. Obviously, you don't want to damage any of the seaweed or the shellfish that are growing. And you want to ensure that you're not damaging the rope or the structure or the integrity of the farm. Another thing to consider is long duration testing. So when someone goes out to a farm, they've got a whole list of things to do and they want to be able to um, rely on the sensor system to do what it needs to do without much interference and without much maintenance. So we want to design the system in a way that's uh, very easy to put on and take off again. So we're currently uh, looking at these different types of clamps. And finally, there's, there's a need to not only go to this farm and download the data, but we want to have live data. And current solutions for that can be quite expensive. You typically need a data plan. You may need some expensive um, data transmission equipment and all that stuff is quite power hungry. And for your five person seaweed or shellfish farm, that's completely inviolable. So there's, um, there's a need to develop some low cost, uh, medium to long range data telemetry solution. And currently we're exploring the LoRaWAN network for this. So this project has only just begun about a month ago um, and it's running for the next 11 months and it's supported by uh, Innovate UK grant. And just to finish off, we um, uh, give you a quick introduction to our facility. So this was built from November until April over the winter and we are currently conducting cultivation trials on uh, mostly lava and dulse for food applications. And we're also using this facility to grow kelp seeds for seaweed hatcheries, uh, sea seaweed uh, sea farms around the UK. So uh, here's my contact details. Feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. And thank you for the opportunity to present to you. Thank you, Grison. This is a very interesting talk, which um, moves uh, to a different level, which is even before you have your, your uh, aquaculture farm set up, you may need to consider you know, where you want to place it and uh, what are the environmental parameters that you may want to get to be able to make a wise decision. Uh, we don't have speak, uh, questions at, at this moment, but I do have one question. Um, so uh, Professor David Gethin mentioned, you know, some commercial sensors, these ones that we are using uh, at, uh, at sea farms, measuring the environmental parameters, they can go up uh, to 20K, uh, and this is in pounds. So uh, what is the flexibility there to have a system and cheaper and how much cheaper can we get? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, cost came up a lot of times today. Um, we want to, we think around um, less than a grand, one thousand pound per cultivation season for for a, a seaweed or um, a, like a low trophic aquaculture business is a reasonable price to expect. I mean, as a, as a you know, as a sort of quick calculation, if you have a successful budget, uh, successful harvest from a seaweed farm, you make between. Um, 20 to 30K in revenue in total. And then you've got to pay for your seed, for your boats, for the people. So we really can't expect people to pay 
much more than a thousand pounds to do the data, to get the data. Um, we also think that making the equipment um, available as a rental service is, is a good way to go because it means the sort of daily maintenance and repairs are not with the sea farm sea farmer itself and would be with the company renting out the equipment that yeah just saves time as well so yeah i guess one thousand pound is our sort of aim I, I don't think we'll get there in the in the near term but if you can have the demand from for some volume and use uh yeah low-cost microcontrollers and data comms maybe you can reach that Speaking of, of data and how this data is being communicated in a way, there is a question from John Ronan. Uh, are you using the Things Network or deploying your own um, LORA, which I'm not, uh, LORA stack, or are you using LORA in direct mode? I'm not sure what, uh, low range, I suppose. LORA is low range, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah, so, um... LoRaWAN is a way of, uh, yeah, communicating up to, I'd say, 10 kilometers. Mm. Uh, we're only just testing the first bit of equipment. So um, I think we need some more data. In terms of your question, you're deploying your own, so using. Yes, uh, so using Things Network or deploying your own. Yeah, so, so yeah, so we've, um, I can't answer that question because um, the system we're using is like still in development and we're right. actually employed, we're, we're going to be testing both systems. So we don't know which way we'll go. But if you have some experience on that, I think it might be uh, useful for us to chat to you. Maybe we can pick up from your experiences. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just closing this, but before we go, I just wanted to highlight that uh, there are several things in the chat box. So for instance, Adam is mentioning you, Christian, um, and uh, other people that are trying to engage. So do check the chat box before we all leave. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, by all means, send us an email. I just want to share a few things with you today. We've had an amazing audience and I really want to uh, also to really give a big thank you to, um, uh, to our speakers. Uh, I mean, you've, you've been uh, fantastic, you've made this possible. And I think by now we have a better understanding of, uh, of what is precision and aquaculture, what are the different projects and companies that are working in precision uh, aquaculture using sensors, uh, and what are the needs of the industry. We've seen uh, you know, uh, shellfish in, in Ireland. Uh, Brian, thank you for, for that. Uh, we've seen that uh, you know, everyone is very uh, consistent in saying we need sensors that can provide, of course, real data, but they are uh, uh, durable. And that's uh, many questions were, were addressed uh, concerning the durability, for instance. These were addressed to Sofia Teixeira, who's working on a different type of sensors, a more, uh, well, three different type of sensors in the fish, wear by the fish and in the environment. Uh, Professor David Gethin was uh, mentioning about uh, printable sensors and how this can actually uh, be a very good technology and how it, it is being used um, and can be way much cheaper uh, so, and then we, we moved on to, uh, to the second session, this session now, uh, where we uh, approach uh, Paul Shanahan from, from Ireland was approaching the coastal monitoring radar and the importance of having uh, real data on, on the weather uh, as in a very localized and very important for the local communities and having the ability to share this on social media, which, uh, which that is for sure democratizing the data, uh, you know, as, as uh, Christian was mentioning now, uh, in this last talk that there is a need to democratize a bit uh, the, this data. Um, so uh, we had three speakers from the, the from Caesar, we had Paul, Paul House uh, presenting Caesar, and then we had uh, Dr. Pete Jones and Dr. Josh Jones explaining a bit of the research taking place here. Uh, we had, uh, again, uh, a bit more about welfare, and in this case, uh, lumpfish using uh, machine vision and uh, the ability of this technology to be able to analyze the behavior which is which is very important when we are talking about welfare and then finally christine just now gave a very interesting talk uh, which i think was, was very meaningful a different approach uh, in in this case uh, more towards uh, uh, you know the the seaweeds and shellfish 
and having I think it's an amazing goal to have a, a, you know maximum of 1000 pounds if we could achieve that that would be fantastic so I have I only have to also thank you the uh, you know the, the projects that uh, are hosting and supporting this webinar very important information that many of you in the audience have asked. We will share the, the PowerPoint. Um, we will most probably have uh, also this uh, webinar on, on YouTube. You will receive this information. And tomorrow, you will have an email on your uh, inbox for those of you who have been with us. You'll have an email uh, with your uh, certificate of participation. And also, we would be very, very grateful if you could, uh, we will have a form, a feedback form, if you could, have, could provide us with your feedback. So I'm going to stop. And of course, all this information, if you want to have more updates, I mentioned a webinar coming up in July regarding aquaculture and spatial planning. And we usually run other webinars on aquaculture and sustainable aquaculture in general. So uh, take a look at, at our Twitter accounts and websites. We shared some on the chat box. So by all means, go there. And we were very, very happy to welcome you again. And if you have any questions, um, please do drop us an email. Um, and you can have all this information on our websites. So I'm going to stop share. Just really a big thank you. And if you can all uh, share your screen, a uh, big, big thank you to, to all the speakers who've been here today for the for giving your talks and for contributing to the, the Q&A sessions. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else to say. Hugh, thank you so much. Hugh was uh, chairing the, in the beginning this, uh, this session and facilitating and organizing uh, the webinar. So thank you. Thank you all. I'm just going to end this and saying goodbye. Have a very nice week. And it's raining in Wales, I suppose, the same in Ireland. I hope for every wine in the world, because we had 140 participants uh, at some points, wherever you are in the world. We hope you have better weather than most of the speakers have in Ireland and Wales. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you.